Is there anybody excited about Father's Day today? Give it up for dads. We want to welcome all of you, all of you in the house, all of you watching online. And hey, just to make sure you're connected, if you're brand new with us or if you haven't done this yet, make sure that you download our church app on your device. And you know everything that's going on because the best way to grow in God is to be connected with God's family, his church. And uh, so we have the connect groups. If you're not a part of any of our groups, uh, this is week number three. Also, Red, White, and Boom our 4th of July event. How many are going to be around on the 4th of July? Yes, yes. Well, hey, make sure you come here and sign up to serve for an hour while you're here too. So we have like a three-hour event. You can go out and you, you can sign up to set up, tear down, come watch the band, and then like serve in the bouncy houses for a little bit. You don't have to bounce with the kids. You just watch them and make sure everyone that goes in comes out. That's all you got to do. So uh, check that out. It's going to be a great time. Also, we'll put up the groups here as well. Uh, if you're not connected to a group, you can even host your own group as a part of what we do on Sundays as we have an outline of today's message. At the end of that, we have a discussion guide. You can actually, if you're not a part of a group or you're not able to make one of those groups, you can have your own group and you can go through the discussion guide every week and grow in the Lord and take the message with you and its application of scripture throughout the week and do that. Um, also talking about, let me jump back to the 4th of July event. Those of you who are participating in two weeks, we're going to have a, a meeting after each service. Just kind of make sure everybody's comfortable with what we're doing and, and see where you are signed up. So check that out as well. Be prepared for that. Uh, if you brought an offering today, I want you to know thank you for giving to the Lord and being faithful of your tithes and offerings. Uh, there, if you brought an offering and we have receptacles, giving boxes throughout the building, those of you watching online can click a button or on your app, you can give through your app. I'm just so thankful uh, that we have a way to have an eternal investment. And so I want to thank every one of you for the way that you give to be able to preach the gospel in our community and throughout the world. If you're joining us for, like for the very first time, uh, this is our first message in this series of four called Strong, called Strong. Because if you're a follower of Christ, no matter who you are, you have the potential of supernatural greatness as we allow God to work through us. And in this series, uh, I'm going to talk about some areas particularly related to men. But ladies, I'm not going to leave you out. It's going to have application for your life too. But the reality is, um, and this is so important, historically, there's often been a shortage of strong and godly men. And I want to read a verse that, that God speaks. It's a tragic verse, one of the most tragic throughout all the scripture. But I want to read uh, to get into this message. I want to read it each message in this series. But in Ezekiel, God said, I look for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land, so I would not have to destroy it. But what did God say? I found none. I found there was no one, no strong man to stand in the gap. So if, we were, if God was speaking that today, what would he say? He would say, I'm looking for a man of integrity. I'm looking for a man of, of character. I'm looking for a man who will help those who need some help to be lifted up. I'm looking for a man who will lay down his life for his bride. It's Christ laid down his life for the church. I'm looking for a man who will impart spiritual truths on the next generation. I'm looking for a man to stand in that gap, a strong man. God is looking for men to influence the world for his glory. And guys, speaking of Father's Day, you, Dad, you really have an incredible spiritual influence on the generations to come. Uh, look at these statistics. It's from the lookout a while back. And, and uh, listen to these statistics. It says if a teenager comes to Christ, there's an 18% chance that that child can influence their family for Christ. If a woman comes to Christ, there's a 31% opportunity that she's going to share her faith in such a way with their family that they're going to they're gonna come, come to know the Lord. Men, check this out. There's a 93% chance if you come to the Lord that you will have an incredible impact on your family and the generations to come and around you. Dad, listen, you can be 
that man. Now, I love this quote we're going to put up. It was spoken to the great evangelist Dwight L. Moody, and it says this, that the world is yet to see what God can do through one man whose heart is totally surrendered to him. And it was said of Dwight L. Moody that he responded in this way, a, a way that I pray that you would declare today. And he said, I will be that man. I will be that man. So we begin today by looking at this character in Scripture, this guy named Samson. And we're going to get an overview of his story today. And he was a strong man in the Bible. And we're specifically going to look at some attitudes that make strong men weak and that make weak men strong. So Samson's accomplishments are legendary, but so are his weaknesses. In fact, men, Samson's a lot like us. He had such God-given potential in his life, and yet again and again, over and over again, he made bad decisions and eventually self-destructed. God had given him, just like you, this potential for righteousness and influence in the world. Yet again and again, he made poor decisions. In fact, I would summarize his life if you're taking notes you can fill in your outline and write this down. The Samson was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. Men, just like so many of us. God had put the potential in him to be so strong, but he had such a weak will that derailed him. So an overview of his story, this is about 1200 BC, known as the period of the judges. And God had, had penalized, had, had like made Israel, his people, to be in bondage to the Philistines for about 40 years. And God said, I'm gonna raise up somebody to free them from the Philistines. And God sent an angel to a couple. What do angels do? We learned this last week. They are messengers. They sent a message to this couple saying essentially this, that you're going to raise up a man will help deliver our people from bondage. And uh, you're going to give birth to a guy named Samson. And from the very beginning of Samson's life, the spirit of the Lord was upon him. And, and God would eventually come upon him in great uh, uh, my, mighty powers of strength when he would uh, decimate the, the people around him, the Philistines. And uh, he would exhibit great feats of strength that's beyond even steroids. <laughs> and the angel told Samson's parents, I want you to raise up your child dedicated to the Nazarite vow. Now, what's a Nazarite vow? Well, it's one you could set any ordinary child apart by observing these three things. We're going to put them up on the screen. Three requirements of the Nazarite vow. There was to be no wine, no Coronas, no martinis, no margaritas, no, 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 no partying with, with alcohol. Number two, you don't go near a dead corpse. You can't touch it. You're not to go even near it. And number three, you're not to get your hair cut. And so, you know, a lot of people say, well, what kind of hairstyle did Samson have? And people ask that, right? I want to tell you with every bit of spiritual integrity that I have, he never had a mullet. <laughs> he never had a mullet, right? Why? Because mullets are ungodly. They always have been throughout history. And everybody who agreed said... Amen, right? Even, even if you wore a mullet in 1986, like I did now, this isn't really a mullet, but this is kind of close. But no, it's not a mullet. But, but God can give you grace even for that mullet in your past, and you can be healed. So his hair actually plays an integral role in the life of Samson and his downfall. But his strength didn't come from his hair, as we're going to see. Uh, but he was set apart by God. That hairstyle um, was a sign that he was set apart by God, and God's hand was upon him, and God's strength was within him. And yet, with with all this potential, he squandered it over and over again. But Samson never really accepted his role as, as a judge, as a defender of God's people. And we'll see that again and again. In fact, we're going to watch a scene uh, from the movie Samson that came out several years ago. And it, it, it illustrates how he wanted to be 
to do his own thing. He was kind of self-centered. And his parents are encouraging him, no, you've been set apart by God. So look at this when we're having a discussion with his parents here. <laughs> I mean, you wish, little brother. <laughs> Another man died today. Tobias was killed by the Philistine commander. You were called by God, gifted with his power to deliver his people. The council think it's his time for a judge to be anointed. We do not need a judge. We need peace. Remember the prophecy. Samson of the tribe of Dan, chosen by the living God to be his hand of vengeance. It's his will. But it is not mine. Son, you are not like other Hebrews. You're meant for so much more. You were meant you never fail to remind me of this. Everything God has required of me, I have done. I kept every vow. No wine. No touching the dead, no cutting of my hair. And where has it gotten me? Where has it gotten us? Are we free from war? Do we have peace? Why does God withhold what we desire? Samson, you must not forget who you are. See, so you had this struggle like so many people to today. Or am I going to do God's will or am I going to do my will? And over and over again, we see him veering off of the path of God's will for his life. And, and you see people doing it all the time. I don't know what it will be for you, but sometimes people forget their calling that God has upon their life. I've seen men who have been very, very aggressive at work. They're just conquering everything at work, type A leaders. But yet at home, they're totally hands off totally passive and they don't lead their family they don't lead their children they're committed in one place but they've forgotten who they're supposed to be at home I've known men who are committed to their finances to their careers to their hobbies but they co can't commit to a woman or treat a woman the way God's called them to be committed I know guys who will research everything from fishing to which is the best car. I mean, they spend hours and hours doing that, but they won't spend five minutes a day to build up their life spiritually. So many men that love their wives and yet they're trapped in a prison of lust and they don't recognize the danger. So much potential and yet making bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. Why do you think so many potentially strong men fall apart? They've forgotten whose they are in Jesus Christ, as did Samson in God. Samson's life illustrates, I think, three specific attitudes that make strong men weak. If you're filling in your outline, if you're writing stuff down, the first attitude is this, the attitude of, of lust. I want it. I see it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to do whatever it takes because I want it. I've got to have it. So men today... Uh, would you say, I want it with me on the count of three? One, two, three. It didn't sound like you wanted it very bad. <laughs> Let's do it again because you really want it, okay? One, two, three. I want it. Yeah, you got to say it with a growl. I'm a man. I want it. I see it. I want to have it. I want it, right? Uh, and what will happen, is there a man who wants something, He I'm t and he's going to get it, but, but there's this lust figure, and all logic and rationale is tossed out the window when he wants something. It might be that he wants the woman. It could be that he wants the advancement in the career that he has or the money that he's going to earn. He wants to conquer something. I mean, it could be I'm going to get the boat. I'm going to get the new house. I'm going to get the car, whatever it is. But when he goes after that with that lust in his heart, he's just going to forget all logic and go after that thing with reckless abandon. And we see this in Samson's life over and over again. Look at this from Judges chapter 14 in verse 1. It says that Samson went down to Timnah and he saw there a smoking hot young Philistine woman. Now, I added that part. Uh, <laughs> 
But all logic went out the window because you've got to imagine that's what he saw. But he wasn't to have her because she was of the Philistine tribe, right? And, but it says, when he returned, he went there, and when he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah, and I want to, I want to have it. I want it. I want, get her for me as my wife. And so what did he do? He left Zora, his hometown, and went and traveled four miles down to Timnah, which was an enemy territory. It's Philistine territory. So he left his friends and went among his enemies. And the reason that he wasn't supposed to marry a Philistine was because they worshiped different gods, not the one true and living God. And at that moment, he looks at her and he forgets everything else. And he says, I want it. I don't care what my God says. I don't care what my dad says. I don't care what my mom says. I want her, and I'm going to have her. I'm going to get her. Over and over again, we see that lust makes strong men weak. A second attitude that we see over and over again is this sense of entitlement. I deserve it. Not only men do we want it, but we can begin to think that, hey, I deserve that. So everybody this time say, I deserve it. One, two, three. I deserve it. Oh, that's good. That's good. I work hard. I deserve that. I've been dealt a bad hand. I deserve that. I put up with her. I put up with him. I deserve it. Whatever it is, I deserve it. And Samson had this entitlement attitude. So Samson's going along all day one day. He's still struggling with, do I do my will? Do I do God's will? Show me a sign, Lord. And, and this lion comes and attacks him. And you might be saying, oh, no big deal. A lion attacked David, and David killed the lion. Well, if that's your attitude, you've never been out in the wild when a lion came and attacked you. <laughs> it's pretty traumatic when that happens. But when the lion attacked Samson, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he got the sign that he wanted. So we're going to see this scene uh, in the video clip right here. What do you want from me? Am I called to lead your people? <laughs> then show me a sign. Two lessons for that. Number one, be careful when you ask for a sign. <laughs> and number two, when you get it, you better listen. But he's vacillating between doing his will and God's will, and we just see this. So sometime later, he goes back down to Timnah. We don't know how long it was, but he went back to marry the Philistine lady. And look at what he does. It says, sometime later, when he went back to marry her, what, what's it say here? He turned aside. And, and this is where we got to watch it, guys. When God's given us a path to take and we veer off the path, that's when we get into trouble. He, he turned aside uh, to look at the lion's carcass. So here's this rotted uh, lion that he just killed. And it says, in it was a swarm of bees and some honey, which he scooped out with his hands, and he ate it as he, he went along. Now, that's kind of gross if you can picture this half-rotted carcass. Uh, and remember what he wasn't supposed to do. He wasn't supposed to go near 
anything that was dead, right? But, but he just, he reaches in with all of this stench and he pulls out this honey. That's gross. And uh, you know why that's gross? Because men were gross. <laughs> I'm just saying, would you say it with me as a, as a group of people? One, two, three, we're gross. Yeah, and I'll prove it too. If you don't believe me, how does a man determine whether or not a shirt on the floor is clean or not? What's he do? Yeah, he picks it up. Yeah, and, and if he knows it's dirty, well, what do you, you just turn it inside out and put it on. I got another day. We're gross like that, right? I know you've done that. But remember the Nazarite vow. He's not supposed to touch or go near dead things. But the same God that has blessed him, he turns against that and betrays his God for a handful of honey. A handful of honey. He broke his vow. He didn't take it seriously for a handful of honey. Who would be brazen enough to betray God for a handful of honey? Yeah, men do it every day. They do. They betray the God who forgave them. The God who blessed them for this temporary, sinful thing, sometimes silly things, because I lost after it. I want it. And you know what? I deserve this thing. And then whenever temptation comes, here's a third attitude that makes strong men weak, and that's this, this attitude of pride. This attitude of pride, you know, I can handle it. I can handle anything, right? We're strong, right? We think I can handle it. Now, let's go back to the three parts of the Nazarite vow. What were they? Don't cut your hair, don't, and don't go near anything dead, right? So what does Samson do? I think I can handle Look at what it says here in this, this next verse. Now, his father went down to see the woman. And Samson made a what? A feast there, as was customary for bridegrooms. So what's he doing? He's preparing a wedding. Now this word in the Hebrew that's translated feast is the word mishteh, which literally means to party, which literally means, it's literally translated an occasion for drinking. So what's he doing? He's throwing himself a keg party. <laughs> He's getting all his buddies together. He's like, tap the keg, dude. We're going to party because guess what? I can handle it. But what was he doing in that moment? He was breaking his vow yet again, forgetting the God who blessed him. And that's what happens to strong men over and over again. God's given you the potential to do good works, to serve him, to bring glory to his name. But we get sidetracked on our own personal mission, no matter the cost, because I'm strong. I can handle it. God will understand. And I don't know what it would be for you, but we all know the person, right? Who potentially thinks, I want the drink, I want the pills, I want the smoke, whatever it is, I can handle it. And we see before long that actually the substance handles them. We've known the person over and over who says, I want the boat, I want the car, I want the toys, I can handle the payments. And it's not long that they're drowning beneath the sea of debt. I want it, I deserve her. And the next thing you know, his attraction destroys his integrity. I'm strong. I want it. I deserve it. I can handle it. So let's fast forward just for a moment to the very, very end of Samson's life. We're going to see this in the fourth message, in the final message in this series. But, but he ends up at the end of his life. We're going to see the strongest man who, who ever lived. From birth, God's hand was upon him. And we're going to see him with his eyes gouged out. He's a prisoner before 3,000 of the enemy Philistines. He's the laughing stock. He's their entertainment. He's become weak because of all of his lust, all of his entitlement, all of his pride. It takes him down. And you might think, well, is, is, are you telling me I want to get my eyes gouged out? No, but it could be a lot, lot worse. It could be that you're going to find yourself in your 40s or your 50s or your 60s and, and you're going to be alone and you're going to be in that moment in a failed marriage looking back on it and you're going to say it was mostly my fault and you're going to live with that regret or there might be a day when your children don't even want to see you anymore because of that thing that you did and they don't want to see you on Christmas they don't want to see you on Father's Day they, don't want, they just don't want to see you it could be a time when your private life becomes public and you're living now in humiliation but here's the deal just like what we're going to find out in Samson's life it doesn't have to end that way. 
because there is a God who loves you. And if you're a Christian who lives in you, you have his power in you. No matter what you've done, God can forgive you and transform your life. And he can make you strong again. He can make you a man of faith. He can make you a godly husband, a godly dad. No matter what's happened, God can make you strong. If you stop trying to be strong on your own. No matter what you've done, you can be different because this is, this is the truth. I, the reality is our spiritual enemy, Satan, what's he doing? He's trying to make strong men weak. He's going to trap you. He's going to tackle you. He's going to throw temptation at you. But we have a God who will make weak men strong. There are attitudes that make strong men weak, right? I want it, I deserve it, I can handle it. But there are attitudes that make weak men strong. Instead of saying, I want it We've got to declare, I am weak and I want God. Can somebody say, I want God this morning? One, two, three. I want God in my life. I need God. I need his strength. I need his daily power. I want him ordering my steps. I want his spirit convicting me when I sin. I want him leading me in righteousness. I want God. Well, you know, religion is just a crutch for the weak. Yes, absolutely. Unquestionably, it's for the weak and I am weak. And I want God. Have you ever wondered what Samson looked like? I mean, we're watching the video clips, and he's pretty buff, and, and he's got the steroid brow, and he's strong, <laughs> you know. And, but one commentator suggested this, and I agree with him, that Samson probably looked very, very ordinary in appearance because people didn't say, oh, he's strong because of his physique, because he's so huge. They kept asking in Samson's story, what's the secret of your strength? So if Samson looked like, like, like the rock or Arnold Schwarzenegger, we'd go, yeah, we get that. But if he looked like Pastor Phil, <laughs> that'd be a miracle, <laughs> right? Thanks, Phil. <laughs> Oswald Sanders, <laughs> Oswald Sanders in his book, Spiritual Manpower wrote this. Yeah, I'll take you to golf too in a couple of weeks, Phil. <laughs> All right. Um, he wrote this, as no other Bible character, Samson exemplified in his body the connection between physical strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. He said this, the strength to fight life's battles comes from God alone. See, Samson's strength wasn't in his bulk, wasn't in his hair. It was his, the Spirit of God upon his life. And that's where you're going to get your strength, not in your own power. But you're going to have to become weak before God makes you strong. And we've got to understand this significant point. So men, when we're saying I deserve it and feel entitled, here's an attitude, a second attitude that makes men strong is when you know I deserve death. I don't deserve anything in this life. But you know what? We deserve, we deserve death. Ladies, I know this whole message series, you're going back, get out, pour it on those men. <laughs> oh, they need it. Oh, kick them when they're down. Oh. But the truth is, you deserve death too. You do. <laughs> because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That we're all sinful as we stand before a holy God. So we never say, God, you owe me this. We're never to have that attitude, but humbly we're to say, God, let me humble myself because we deserve death. And, and I realize that you sent your one and only son to, to be sin for me. You died on the cross to give me life. So that's the attitude that helps us become strong is to realize and to admit I, I'm weak. And I thank you, O oh Lord, because I deserve death, but you're not giving that to me. Now, Thirdly, when every other man says, I can handle it, right, what are you going to say? You're going to say, I can't handle anything without God. I don't know about you guys especially, but I, I am capable of every ungodly act without the power of God in my life. And that's how I lived my life before I came to Christ. I mean, I had a guy last week come up and, and say to me, you know, I, I'm so thankful and blessed by this church. God's been transforming my life. And then he said, I, I just thank you for your example. And I'm just so humbled by that. And, and I want you to know when I stand up here and speak that I'm the first one to tell you that I am not perfect. 
and my wife is the second person and my kids are the third <laughs> to tell you that I am not perfect. <laughs> but what you need to understand is I'm not strong. I just don't have that power. I will tell you I am weak and I tell you here's the difference. The only way that I can stand strong is because I am on my knees every day before a holy God surrendering myself yes so I am weak and vulnerable but I am capable of doing anything ungodly without the presence of God in my life and so are you and you got to get this if we want to be strong we've got to have the courage enough to cry out God give me strength that's what we've got to do some of you today need to be weak enough to be able to cry out for help. You need to be weak enough to confess your sins. You need to be weak enough to stand before somebody and say, you know what, I need your prayers. I need your help. I need your support. I need your accountability. This is a deal. When you think you're strong, you've got a spiritual enemy. And his goal is to take you down and to make you weak. But you have a heavenly father who will fill you with his spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that when you're weak and you humble yourself, that he will fill you with his power and make you strong. Look at what 2 Corinthians says. My grace is sufficient for you for my what? My strength is made perfect in what? In weakness. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Finally, he says, be what? Strong how? In the Lord and in his mighty power. Men, you got to know this. God has created you with spiritual greatness. And the world is yet to see what God can do through one man wholly surrendered unto him. You can be that man. You can be that man. You can be that woman fully surrendered to God. Would you pray with me? God, I pray today for your presence, for your spirit, that you would stir us, men, women, young and old, to the desperate point of need where we realize our weakness and call on you to be our strength. When we face temptation, thank you, God, that you promise a way out in your strength. When we have a relational challenge, you give us wisdom and the strength to endure. For the person today who feels like giving up and feels like a failure, I pray your spirit would be their strength and they would realize that you make all things new. I pray especially for men, for dads, you're calling on their life to, to, to raise them up to their full potential in you. God, the world is yet to see what you could do through these men. Holy surrender to you. I pray you would raise up such men. Thank you for your mercy. Though we deserve death because of our sin that you sent your one and only son to save us, that he took all our sins and became sin for us. And you offer us salvation. Who's Jesus? In him, there is eternal life. You tell us clearly in your word that when we believe that truth, that we place our faith in Jesus, repent of our sins, turn from our ways and follow your will for our life and are baptized into Christ. You give us the power to live a holy life through the indwelling gift of your Holy Spirit. Help us today, Lord, to realize that we're only strong in your power and in your might that we are nothing without you. Thank you for your power. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people who agreed said, Amen. Amen.